Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Um, hello and welcome to the first BMJ webinar on um, access to personal health records. Um, I'm Henry Scowcroft. I'm a patient editor here at the BMJ. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, this is a the access issue of um, personal health, health records and access to them is an important one for us at the BMJ. Um, it has been for a number of years, um, but it's even more so now it's become part of our refreshed patient public partnership strategy where we're trying to see if we can drive progress discussion and debate around a number of issues. And this is one of them. Um, it's a it's an important issue. It's not just about access. It's about full rapid access to all of one's access all of, all of one's personal health records i think a number of countries have taken steps in this direction but very few have got have got to to, to the end point that many of us would feel is is, is where we want to get to um, the question is why why have barriers been in place why has progress been slow um, there are exceptions but in general i think this has been a frustrating field for everyone and everyone concerned so we're hosting these webinars to try and explore these issues um, this is the first webinar in the series and tonight we'll be focusing on ethics um, the issue of ethics and specifically is it ethical to deny people full rapid access to their personal health, re health records um, we've got a fantastic panel to discuss this tonight um, and I'd like to welcome them all now. Um, we have, in no particular order, Alex Caffet, who is an expert on technology, healthcare data, and transparency. Um, he's been in health policy, health policy in areas such as public-private partnerships, patient safety, NHS data sets and technology, digital services, and information for over 20 years. Um, in 2018, Alex was an advisor to the independent inquiry um, on the issues raised by the breast surgeon Ian Patterson. Um, he's a campaigner for better transparency of outcomes and care to improve services and splits his time between being a non-executive role, uh, between a non-executive role with the NHS in East London and the Australian health data company Beamtree. Hanifa Reshepi is a health informatics researcher with a focus on e-health for patients in general. Um, she has extensive experience um, of studying patients' access to their medical records and how the implementation of such as e-health services impacts different patient groups and healthcare. She also has a background in medical nursing and is based at uh, the University of Skövde in Sweden, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Harlan Krumholtz is a cardiologist and scientist at Yale University and Yale New Haven Hospital. He's a leading expert in the science of improving the quality of efficiency of care, eliminating disparities and promoting equity, and improving integrity and transparency in medical research. To open proceedings, um, we'll be hearing from our two presenters. Uh, Charlotte Blees was formerly a lecturer in philosophy and is now an interdisciplinary health researcher at Open Notes at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, part of Harvard Medical School. She's published over 90 peer reviewed articles and book chapters on medicine and psychology. But to kick us off, we have Adam Hayden. Uh, Adam is a writer, a speaker, and organizer. After his brain cancer di diagnosis in 2016, Adam relied on his background in philosophy to make meaning of an illness that otherwise seemed senseless. He serves on the board of directors for the National Brain Tumor Society. He's written many articles and opinions on cancer survivorship. Adam and his wife, Whitney, have three young boys of whom they couldn't be more proud. Um, before I hand over to Adam, um, if you're tweeting about the event, please use the hashtag uh, BMJ Records Access. We will have time for questions at the end, so please do post questions in the chat box. And I will now hand over to Adam and Charlotte to kick us off. Adam, over to you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Henry. It's just really an honor uh, to be here. Uh, many of my fellow panelists, uh, these are folks who I have read <laughs> in a research setting. Uh, so to be presenting alongside them is really an honor. Uh, in fact, when I was diagnosed uh, with brain cancer, with glioblastoma in 2016, uh, I was completing uh, my graduate requirements for a degree in philosophy. Um, so to talk about the patient perspective through the lens of medical ethics, uh, it just is layered uh, upon layered meaning uh, for me. Um, I just want to set the stage a little bit here for us. I want to begin with a quote uh, from a physician, researcher, speaker, uh, Lucy Kalanithi, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, Lucy said in a TED talk a couple of years ago, it's important for folks, uh, especially clinicians, uh, to understand the experience of illness, not only uh, the technicalities. I think understanding experience, uh, we do that best uh, through storytelling. Uh, so storytelling is a great gateway uh, to understanding another person's experience. Uh, really, it's a great entry point uh, for ethics uh, generally. 
uh, because when we tell stories, when we hear stories, uh, we use our moral imagination. We imagine ourselves into the life worlds uh, of the other. Uh, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about my story, uh, but I hope that as you hear uh, clinicians, caregivers, uh, patient stories during this webinar series, uh, that we see uh, how we can really deepen our understanding of the other uh, through this empathetic witnessing uh, that comes to us uh, through storytelling. Uh, so imagine yourself, uh, late 2014, man, that was a different world in 2014. Uh, the day after Christmas, December 26th, a weird thing happened to me. In fact, I experienced a seizure, a partial seizure. Uh, it was uh, rather mild, a lot of loss of, of sensation and motor control in the left side of my body, uh, some dizziness, some strange tingling at the base of my skull. Uh, this episode uh, lasted oh, about six minutes or so. Uh, I was 32 years old, otherwise healthy. I was a grad student at the time, a bartending in the evenings uh, to help pay the bills. Uh, my wife uh, working outside of the home, a growing family. So it was easy uh, in 2014 to say, boy, you got a lot going on. Uh, maybe this was just stress related. So we didn't diagnose it as a seizure at the time. Uh, we in fact didn't think anything of it uh, until a similar episode happened in 2015, a few months later in the spring of that year, uh, which really launched me and my general practitioner on the kind of a circuitous path to diagnosis. We thought maybe positional vertigo, maybe some circulatory issue, uh, perhaps nerve damage of all things, or uh, we couldn't quite jettison this idea uh, that this strange manifestation, this kind of uh, bodily presentation of stress that was happening in my life. Uh, so from 2015 into the beginning of 2016, these episodes continued. In fact, they continued uh, to increase uh, with intensity, uh, with duration, uh, with frequency. Uh, so by the spring of 2016, almost a year and a half, uh, after that first presentation, uh, these episodes had become so debilitating uh, that my general practitioner said, we better get you to an MRI. That MRI revealed a 71 millimeter primary brain tumor in my right parietal lobe. Now, what does all that mean? Well, 71 millimeters, it's about seven centimeters. Uh, that's a large mass <laughs> to have. You don't have a whole lot of room up there uh, between the brain and the skull. Uh, it was in the parietal lobe. This con uh, controls kind of sensory input and motor movement for the opposite side of your body. Uh, so all of these symptoms that I was experiencing uh, suddenly uh, were kind of snapped into high definition uh, with this MRI scan. Uh, but I started with this quote from Lucy Kalanithi, this, we got to understand the experience, not only the technicalities, where where do we bridge the gap between patient experience and disease uh, presentation or disease technicalities? Well, I suggest that one of the ways that we bridge the gap uh, is through looking at progress notes, looking at a patient's medical record, uh, perhaps through that entire year plus uh, of this kind of diagnostic journey. If I had had access to understand how was my clinician documenting uh, these episodes, these symptoms that I was taking to them uh, during our clinical encounters, then maybe I could have said, well, gee, doc, actually, uh, we need to add on some more information. Or I could say, gee, doc, uh, it looks like what you have documented here is not exactly uh, what I'm experiencing. Uh, so perhaps that year and a half journey to my diagnosis, uh, we could have uh, expedited that process. Maybe instead of a 71 millimeter primary brain tumor, uh, perhaps we would have seen a lower grade malignancy that was smaller in size uh, if we had gotten to that MRI scan sooner. Now, I want to just point out, this isn't the fault of my clinician. I don't blame my general practitioner for got, not getting to this diagnosis sooner. In fact, this is a systems issue. Uh, the system here is that we have not been providing transparent medical record access to our patients. Uh, so as we kick off uh, this medical ethics uh, uh, episode, this webinar rather today to begin this series, I hope that we think some about the experience of others, the stories that we hear, and really bridging the gap uh, between patient experience and the technicalities of disease presentation. And I think medical records access uh, is one entry point uh, to closing that gap. Uh, so that's a bit about my story. I look forward to engaging with you throughout the webinar. Uh, and now I'm gonna uh, go to my friend, uh, Charlotte, who's gonna speak more about her experience. Thank you so much, Adam, for sharing your story and for kicking us off here. And I also want to thank the BMGA for running this webinar and for putting 
ethics sort of the elephant in the room when it comes to online record access front and center sometimes ethics is sort of pushed to the background of these discussions but it such a central issue and I think it deserved to be tackled head on. So is online access the right thing to do? Let's see if I can get my slides to work. Doesn't seem to be moving forward. Um, gosh, I'll, I'll perhaps just begin the discussion by simply saying that um, online record access, I wanted to present three basic basic ideas here. Um, but to kick us off by saying that when we talk about sharing open notes, we often refer to a sort of a, a term of art, uh, which means sharing just the visit note summaries. Uh, but other researchers and other clinicians use a very different um, nomenclature, which would be patient access to electronic health records or online record access. Um, so with that in mind, um, I wanted to start by saying that the first consideration uh, is to put things into a kind of historical um, context here. And that is to say that through most of medical history, um, the guiding ethical principle has been paternalism in healthcare. Uh, that is to say that the doctor knows best and that the doctor can Nowadays, we eschew medical paternalism in healthcare, and a patient, it's a, it's a clinician's duty to be open, honest, to provide adequate disclosures to patients in respect of their health information. The second related sort of historical context here is to think about uh, the statutory right of patients in many countries, including in the United States and in the UK, for many years, at least two decades, to have access to their clinical notes. That is to say, their, the copies of their records, not online access, but copies of their record. So I think we've got to bear that in mind as well throughout this discussion. The second point that I really wanted to make was to think about this, what is the right thing for doctors to do? And we tend to think about this in a terms of a sort of a pie chart of different concerns and considerations or ethical norms. So we know for, start, to start with that the doctor has a duty of beneficence to patients. That is to say they have a duty to promote the health and the well-being of patients. Equally, they have a duty to uh, do no harm, first do no harm. Um, and of course, or where uh, necessary to minimize harm. So a surgeon cannot uh, perform surgery without making an incision. So to minimize harm where possible. Uh, clinicians also have a duty, as we've said, to respect the autonomy of the patient. Uh, but they also have a duty uh, of of that fiduciary trustful relationship uh, to promote security, confidentiality, and so on. Um, and they have a duty of justice, that is at the face-to-face -face appointment to promote equity in care. Now I take it with respect of each of these different duties and ethical norms, a, a genuine ethical dilemma can be said to arise when there's a tension point between at least two of these. And what I want us to consider today is whether a genuine ethical dilemma does arise or indeed whether these are just perceived dilemmas and they can be worked around. Um, and in relation to that, no doubt we will be discussing patients' experiences with their notes and their records, as Adam has said. Um, but there is also a considerable body of knowledge on clinicians' perceptions of patients' experiences. And I think we have to relegate that um, to the right level of ep epistemic uh, credibility. That is to say, clinicians are not soothsayers and they're not able to discern accurately, um, as we'll talk about, no doubt, patients own experiences. But in addition, clinicians do have a lived experience with, with patient access and have valuable insights uh, or experiences that no doubt we will mention as well. Finally, I wanted to, the third point I wanted to make was in terms of the optics of the discussion, which is to say that uh, when we talk about the ethics of an innovation, we tend to focus on the innovation itself. 
uh, the sort of brand new innovation and you know what are the benefits what are the harms what does this do to justice and patient autonomy and so on but there's a flip side of this this argument and there's a sort of a duality here that I, I really hope we will tease out and that is to say what happens when the notes are closed um, because there's an, sort of an, an inherited structure if you will in healthcare um, and the way things have been done um, does not necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. So we also have to interrogate whether uh, this leads to benefits, harms, what this does to patient autonomy, to the relationship and to justice and care. And I will complete this one slide PowerPoint presentation by stopping there and passing back to Henry for, for starting the discussion. Thank Apologies you. for the, the PowerPoint not working. Don't worry, right. Charlotte, that was fantastic anyway, nevertheless, and um, really some, some fascinating points made there. I just want to start with the first sort of thought that came to mind with this. And, and um, by the way, the other panellists, do feel free to turn your cameras on and we can now get into the, the discussion and the, uh, the questions. But um, my first sort of talking point, I think, on this is, is around this idea of, of do no harm. Um, there's um, a perception perhaps perhaps a, a misperception um, that patients in some way would be harmed by seeing access see, see, by having access to, to medical notes that are written essentially between doctors and I, I wonder if we could sort of briefly start really by considering the harm um, aspect of this um, so so Charlotte first and then we'll sort of go around the room for, for people's perspectives but sure. um, the thought thoughts on 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 harm and patient harm and how actually Yes. This may be looking so, at the, the upside, upside down to start with. Yeah, so I think for understandable reasons, clinicians do uh, express, where well, we know this from survey research, that they worry that patients will be very worried by what they read. Um, but when, you, when we actually look at patients' experiences of the practice, and we've got a considerable body of survey research here, we see that patients... Um, are able to handle what they read um, and very very few patients do report being more anxious as a result of, of getting access to records there's a there's another side of this argument as i said which is well what about the harms when the, when patients don't get access to the records and i think as i've said that this is is a central issue here um, and when patients don't get access they lack an important mechanism to follow up on test results, referrals, to better remember their care plan, to understand the care plan and feel more engaged with it. Um, and we're depriving patients of that uh, extra mechanism to engage in their care. So in addition, Sigal Bell has done some, led some fascinating research in patient errors in documentation. And you know, to err is human. Um, Errors do occur. Around one in five patients, one in five patients do discern an error in their notes. Um, around forty percent of them um, perceive serious errors, and these relate to diagnoses, medications, um, test uh, wrong sidedness, um, and medical history. Uh, also, getting the wrong patients' records. So it's really crucial that we uh, correct those errors to prevent harm. Um, and in fact, the National Academy of Medicine in 2015 cited open notes as a patient safety mechanism. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Hanifa, you, you were... Um, look, yeah. look like you thank you, to Charlotte. Come in, come in it's, so, it's very interesting. I mean, just like Charlotte said, there is extensive research within this area. And I would just like to add that, I mean, when we often discuss harm on patient, uh, I mean, it's, it's many times it's about a fear that um, reading notes or accessing test results will increase anxiety or, or that the patient will not understand the content and get anxious uh, due to that. But I mean, so, so in Sweden, um, we've, um, patients have been able to access their notes and test results since 2013, and we have done extensive research within this area. And, and what we actually have seen is that uh, especially when it comes to cancer patients, we've seen that not or, or having to wait for test results is a more significant source of anxiety than the actual access to test results through the online record. So by actually pro, um, hindering the patients to 
access the notes or test results, we can actually argue that we may be doing them more harm because for many patients um, being forced to wait for the doctor to contact them with test results uh, is a more significant source of anxiety. Thank you. Um, that's a really important point. And I think we, we to, to, to build on that, I think, Alex, it would be good to hear from you about some of the, the, the really quite extraordinary harms that, that, that you've um, been, been part of discussing as part of your work, particularly with the, with the, the Patterson Inquiry, etc. And do you want to come in on that? Yeah, thanks, Harry. And uh, I mean, agree with what everyone said. And I think those two quick points, which is, you know, first of all, these are not kind of contemporaneous notes you're seeing as, as you're in front of the doctor. These, these are your health records, which, which are, as they say, a matter of record, which, which, which goes with you. And, and I think the first point is, especially when you've had a, 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 you know, a frightening diagnosis and Adam will speak more eloquent than me, you've stopped hearing. And actually, you know, once you hear a horrible, a horrible word, and we all know what those words might be. So ha having access to your notes is, is one way of going to be able to digest that and talk about that with 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 peers with family with with help with charities and and so on and so forth as perhaps a discussion for another day which is why I would advocate also having you know videos of, of consultations but but what you were talking about Henry was I worked on this inquiry into Ian Patterson who is a breast surgeon uh, in the West Midlands who was sent to prison for harming over a thousand women and and people can read this in the inquiry one of the many things he did and we have no we will never know why is he he told people who didn't have cancer they did and steered them through in, into a treatment pathway where that cancer was treated this is both in the National Health Service in the UK and in the private sector and it was a matter of record from the pathology that that, that they didn't so perhaps one of the ways he would have been uh, spotted quicker and we put this in in the inquiry was if people had access to their notes they could have gone and queried this you know they those that could understand it and that had the had the means to kind of look it up could have said well hang on I've I've checked the pathology and that's not what that's not what she's saying so that's just one very small use case in 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 how perhaps it would have kind of stopped harm on a on a you know industrial scale as it were yeah thank you um Harlan Adam anything you, you would either of you would like to add on this Harlan first Ooh, we've lost your audio, Harlan. Sorry, thank you. There we go. Uh, um, look, this is a session about the ethics of, of access. And it, I think we need to really focus intently on, you know, this principle of autonomy, the, the right of competent adults to make informed decisions about their own medical care. And if we're going to respect the autonomy of individuals, then we, we have to say that making decisions about what information you can have access to and when is, is counter to the expectation that we want people to make informed choices about what's going to happen to them. And, you, you know, I mean, this gets back to when we always say nothing about me without me. It, it's th this information is critical. And, and for the healthcare system, I mean, it's just an anachronism for us to consider this to be a priesthood on high where we can make decisions about what information is gonna to flow to you because of our expectation about how you receive it. We, we who are advocating for online access, and we can even take the online out, just to say full and complete access to medical records about me, are, are not suggesting that this information gets shoved down people's throats. People still have the ability to say, I actually don't wanna read that. I actually don't wanna partake of that. This is about saying that people should have the opportunity have the opportunity, uh, unfettered, to have full, uh, full access to the information about them sits in charge. And we all know, we in the medical profession know and patients know that, that there's often conflicting information in the chart. There's inaccurate information in the chart. The medical establishment writ large, including we doctors, have not accurately uh, collected and transcribed and documented the information that we've heard, or we haven't sought critical information that may countervene other information. And the harm around that miscommunication, the, the misinformation, I'll say it like that, within the, the records has been enormous. And, but, but I don't even feel like I have to default to like, well, there's a net benefit or not a net benefit. It is simply the right thing to do, to put patients in a position where they can decide, do I want to see my records and in what time frame? For you to say, I'm sorry, I can't give you that result for 48, 72 hours because your doctor needs to have it see it first. And then, and then be able, you know, 
by the way, I can wait 72 hours if I want. I mean, it's essentially saying I can't have the option to see it right away if I want to see it right away. And to me, that's a violation of, of you know, you're basically saying I don't even have that chance to do that. And, and by the way, there's more to this. There's images and other things where I may want us to have go to another doctor and have them take a look at this information or, or re reevaluate it. And, and as long as all of that is difficult, then what we've done is sequester knowledge within a small thing. We've limited choices by patients and we've made it difficult for them to make informed decisions about their care. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on so long, but it's like, th these are the things I think that are, are so critical for us to, to, to move on. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. And I think that's some fascinating points. Um, Adam, would you want to come in just to, on some reflections on what's been said so far from, from your perspective? Oh, that's a generous invitation. I think Harlan spoke to uh, such that ethics of access, I think is an important point. I mean, I think we increasingly are in the world where information is currency. And as we begin to think about, you know, the precision medicine of the future, next uh, generation sequencing uh, for genomic panels, et cetera, you know, that right now patients, uh, we are impoverished if, if information is currency. And so I think uh, the, the wrong answer is, well, let's continue to withhold it. <laughs> you know, the right answer is, Let's spread the wealth. Uh, let's increase the access. Uh, let's increase uh, access to that information that is a currency. So my, yeah. my final point for, on that. <laughs> Fantastic. And I think um, that sort of bridges us to the, to the, to the next sort of uh, thing that we sort of batted back and forth before the session about sort of potential perceived objections um, to, to ethical objections to this, which is the idea of loss of trust and about this might damage the doctor patient relationship. Um, should we start Harlan with you as a, as a, as a clinician, the issues of trust and, and relationships, how do we, how do we respond to those sorts of objections? Well, I think we, we need to then reestablish what trust is about, which is, is about honesty and, and transparency and clarity. Look, if I'm, well, I, I think what, what undermines trust is if I have the presumption that I need to make choices for you, both those choices about what you can have access to as well as what your care options might be. I walk in the room and say, you need surgery on Wednesday without any transparency about what your records are, what the information is. And, and again, we need to be honest about the variability within medical practice, the variability among opinions, among doctors, even you know the very best doctors don't always agree. You know, there's this fear that if we disclose this to patients, if they find out about these things, if they find out what we've been writing, then, then we will have a distress. Well, what, what could we be writing that is going to so undermine that trust? I think trust needs to be built on the fact that we are having honest and, and clear conversations. If I think that there's an issue with you, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to write in the chart something about you. I don't trust this patient. This patient's not following my directions. That's, that's an old school and I, I hope uh, an antiquated way of thinking about the relationship between doctors and patients. The, the new way should be about, uh, let's talk, you know, let's talk. By the way, the patient should be able to talk to me about what, what are the things that I'm doing that could maybe, may, may not be making it as easy for them to be able to make them, the, you know, their journey uh, better and so forth. And we, we need to be able to have authentic conversations. I think this, it, there's nothing I think that is a greater threat to, to the trust between patients and doctors and the idea that there's something going on behind the curtain mm. that I'm not privy to that may be either judging me or is about me or may not even be correct in what I'm portraying, you know? And if you don't believe the symptoms that I'm telling you, for example, tell me, like, don't write in the chart, you know, patients complaining, but it's probably all in their head, it, mm -hmm. which by the way, still is real, <laughs> it's still real. But I mean, we need to be able to say that this is a, uh, this is the way we wanna conduct ourselves in medicine with, with a, a certain ability to have hard, sometimes hard conversations, but not just to write it so the next person sees it, but not have the patient know about it. We have to be able to say, this is, this is what we're gonna talk about. Would anyone else like to come in on, on the concepts of or the issues around trust and, and, and relationship between patient and doctor? I'll jump in there. I mean, one of the things that Tom Delbanco will say, the founder of Open Notes with Jan Walker, is that even the invitation to access the records online is extending a hand um, which show for which uh, the reciprocal response is to trust the person, the doctor, for doing that. And in fact, in the survey, in survey research, we do see that patients report either um, the majority report no difference in their trust but 
a significant percentage report trusting their doctor more. Um, moreover, it's it's minority patients, patients on with, who, with fewer years of formal education who report greater levels of trust um, after uh, they've been offered access to their clinical notes. Um, and, and, we, and Charlotte, yeah. don't we also know this from when, if there's been an error, when we actually, yeah. and I see Helen's on, I mean, there's lots of experts in patient safety, when actually the doctors are honest about errors and problems, people Absolutely. actually trust more, right? Absolutely. Right? And I think that's such a good, great point, because when it comes to, I think, I don't want to speak on behalf of doctors, but anecdotally, I think that many doctors worry about malpractice suits when it comes to sharing the clinical notes. But if anything, I suspect that it will be the opposite because you have built that relationship. You've got that supportive relationship when you access the notes. And we know that when patients feel supported, they're less likely to take a case. And for the reasons we, we discussed earlier, you might be reduced, you know, without injury, there's no tort. So you might be reducing uh, the potential for medical errors. Is there an issue here? Is there a distinction between notes that were previously closed and then opened? versus notes that are written to be open and is there is do we, is there a hump we need to get over here of the a whole load of things being made open that, that people could may argue were never meant to be seen because that, that's what they were they weren't writing them to be seen is that something that we're going to have to deal with as we move forward here I mean, I think we have to, to view this as a multi-purpose tool. The original function of the record was as, as an aid memoir, a record, a detailed um, clinical documentation, but also as a communication tool for other clinicians. But it's now a communication tool for patients. We've got to preserve the detail, but patient, more eyes on the charts has to be a good thing. Yeah. Anyone else like to come in on, on trust and damage relations? Before we move to the next. Uh, just maybe but just kind of like a summary of what we already have talked about i mean if we look at the current research i mean sh actually sharing notes or test results could be a way of fostering a balanced relationship between patients and healthcare professionals because because of transparency that exists when notes are shared and yes. just like um my other colleagues also mentioned is that just the fact that a patient can identify errors and correct these could be a means of um, improving the trust between the doctor and, and the patient. And what's very interesting is that, I mean, if we look at many of the conferences that I have attended with healthcare professionals in, in, in Sweden, it seems to be that there is, it's, a fear exists among them that the patient will find errors and complain. It's something that should be seen as something positive because we have a chance to actually improve something that in the long term can also improve the quality of care. How do we minimize that fear? Anyone got any thoughts on how we can put those concerns, help allay those concerns among I, those that think them. I mean, these are just my experiences when talking with physicians. I believe that an attitude that I have encountered many times in the meetings with, with uh, physicians is that they believe that the, pa the reason why the patients are using the medical record is because they want to identify errors. Mm. Yes. That the main purpose is a negative purpose for using the medical record. But that's really not the fact. I mean, that's I mean, that's not the main reason for why the patients are using the medical record. But, but let me just let's be honest. I mean, that wouldn't be a bad use of, of your no, records. Absolutely I mean, not. there no. are so many errors that I think the point is how we engage constructively about it. But I think we've all seen so many cases where, again, there's conflicting information or there's something, frankly, wrong in the chart or, or, or someone was just pasting something that got propagated within the chart. It wasn't right. And we, and we all know about tragedies where things have been overlooked for too long or, or that things haven't been triggered adequately. There's lots of areas for, for quality. Again, the, I think this notion of more eyeballs on the chart that people can do that. What, what, what I've also found as a main impediment is just concern about time. People start doing that. Then they're, you know, what, what's the mechanism by which I was in a meeting where it, at my own place where someone raised this question, well, what if they start finding mistakes in the chart? We have no capacity to correct them. 
And instead of, and I get where that came from, burned out physicians who just don't know, like, am I gonna be getting a whole bunch of calls? But the, the system response should be, well, heck, let's figure out how we're gonna be able to manage these calls and fix those, that information in the chart so it doesn't harm the patient downstream. I mean, that's what we should be embracing. But, but we've developed a system where we're afraid to know that there might be work to be done that actually ends up correcting errors in the chart. And, and so we have to, I think, yep. reestablish what the North Star yep. is here. And, and if it's patient outcomes and patient care, then, then the idea that there are others looking at it, sort of checking in on the chart, not in a way to gotcha, but in a way to help all together, be sure that the information is accurately reflecting what's going on. I, I just want to say that because I have heard that too, but, but around the, the fear that they're going to, but, but if we try to build a system where we're all holding hands for common purpose, then the, the notion here is of, you know, again, if you're willing to look at the chart and, hey, I actually have an allergy that's not listed here, or that allergy is something I don't think I've, I think that was wrongly placed in my chart, you know, <clears throat> would be of, of great, of great use. If somebody's worried about terms that they're using or descriptions of patients that are, are not, doesn't really honor the relationship, then, you know, that's another thing. And we've got to just work on the professionalism because really that wouldn't even be professional to have that, that kind of thing in the chart. But anyway, these are the things that I think are, are critical that we, we don't want to make people think that you can only look at the chart for certain purposes. And by the way, you're, you know what we, most patients are just mostly concerned with getting really good care and getting good outcomes. Yeah. And if this is a means to do it, then we should be uh, affirming that this is okay. It's okay to challenge us. Okay to tell us their mistakes in the chart. Let us fix it. And we need to build the systems that that don't just dump on the doctors. We're now at the end of the day, they've got a whole bunch of calls to get them to correct, but that we've got the means within the system to automatically uh, evaluate the information and figure out what needs to be fixed. It speaks to a, a wider culture of transparency or lack of, doesn't it? And there's a great phrase after the Bristol inquiry in, in, in the UK in, the, in 2001 when Alan Milburn, the Secretary of State, described the NHS and, and medicine as a, as a secret society. And, and, and I would argue that perhaps not much has changed since then. So I agree with everything Harlem says. And there should be a two-way relationship in that I should be able to see my notes and challenge my notes and challenge whether I've got that right but equally if you think about something like surgery I don't automatically know how many times the surgeon has done that operation and you should be you should be able to say to them how many times have you how many times have you done this someone's going to be the first and I, I have no problem with that but it's better to have that conversation for the individual to say this is the first time I'm operating on you as the lead clinician however I've done this you know 50 times before assisting and 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 so on and so forth and and ditto with treatment options it, it it's generally wrong if you're having talking to a health professional and they give you one treatment option it's perfectly acceptable to say are there any other treatments available available for that and this is where you get into you know doctors particularly wanting to over medicalize where someone might might be content to, to go onto a palliative care pathway because that's best for them and and I think you know having access to your notes is the first step in having a, a grown-up peer-to-peer conversation between the, the the patient and the and the clinician rather than being told this is how you're going to be navigated it, through this is it such a threat because we're really let's call it out we're tipping the balance of power I mean information is power and this is trying to create a more equitable distribution of power. By the way, if it's my body, I should actually hold yeah. most of the power uh, in this relationship because I bear the consequences of what's going to occur. And, and to me, <clears throat> this is, we can talk about a lot of the ethical imperatives, but it also is this issue of disturbing the tradition of the power structure within, within healthcare. Yeah, having your notes is one way of having agency. Well, that brings us neatly onto the next the next discussion area, which is autonomy. Um, and I think within that, I think that was just keeping an eye on some of the questions in the chat. I think something that's come up a lot is about ownership um, and autonomy and ownership are quite intimately linked. Um, how 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 do how do we see issues of ownership and issues of autonomy in this space? I'd like to ask Alex maybe to talk a little, I like the word agency, I use it a lot because I think that ownership, ownership of data gets to be dicey in different places, but this issue of agency, I know Alex, you wanna just expand on what you were saying about agency? I think, you know, with the greatest respect for to our healthcare professionals, 99.9, .9 
percent of them who want to do the best job possible. No one cares. And again, Adam will come in, I'm sure no one cares more about your health than you. And, and so, first of all, you know your record better than the, than, than the doctor who, as you said, Harlem, swears blindly that, that you're not allergic to penicillin because it's not on your medical record, whereas you know you are. Or actually, probably it's worse the other way around, where you're, 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 you're not given that treatment because the record thinks you're access to it. And I, I mean, really, the, I think the point I made earlier, really, that you need agency for yourself or also in circumstances where you're caring for either children who don't have that or, or you know, a, a, a loved one with dementia and whatever, you need to have that shared decision making to, to, to decide what to decide what's best. And, and that that's everything, as I say, from different treatment options for curative versus palliative pathways for for um, um, uh, whether, you know, you want to take a, a, a pharmaceutical based intervention or, or some other intervention and to have that conversation. And to have that and to have that conversation and I think when you don't have it when that's when you get these terrible situations where people are are googling and saying and going for other treatments that are that are absolutely not um uh, valid so you know this is why where the professional is adamant you're going to do this route where people say well I, I've I've googled and and you know I'm going I'm going to sell my house to to self-fund treatment that's self-fund treatment that, that's just absolutely has no efficacy at all because they don't trust what they're being told. Harlan, any, any thoughts on that or indeed anyone else? Adam, do you have any, any, any reflections on, on that from your perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, we started here a little bit on, on ownership. You know, it's, it's interesting. We, we got a, a second opinion on my case uh, and it was on the other side of the country. And so my wife and I toted around uh, you know, binders of medical records and hundreds of discs uh, that, by the way, we had to pay for uh, to, to get from the hospital to take with us. Uh, so certainly that isn't the right model of ownership. But I think there's something, this, this bit of agency uh, is something that I think is, is really interesting because we tend to, you know, tollgate around certain positions and who somebody is. And I think that investment in your own health, right? No one's going to care as much as me, the patient. Um, so here's, a, here's, a, here's an experience. Um, my imaging facility, um, facility is in a different network than where my neuro-oncologist is. Uh, so I get MRIs and then we have to get a disc and take that over uh, to my oncologist's office for the appointment. Uh, we know that it can take up to 24 hours to get the disc. And so we try to plan out those appointments uh, in the right cadence uh, so that we can get the most current MRI scan to my doctor. Uh, well, recently we were kind of running up against uh, a sort of a, a, a deadline to get the disc. Um, my wife is a healthcare worker. It's at her hospital where we have uh, my imaging studies uh, done. Uh, she asked the radiologist, she's like, hey, uh, I know this is a little awkward. Uh, do you think uh, that Adam's scan will be read today? Now there's all manner of HIPAA stuff, but I'm not disclosing my wife's name or institution, so don't get her in trouble. The radiologist said, just go to the reading room, knock on the door and ask them, okay? So that's the experience of somebody in the system. Uh, I shared with my oncologist uh, that I typically read the radiology reports as soon as they are posted. My oncologist said, well, do you always read the radiology reports before we meet? It was clearly distressing to my clinician. So there's something interesting about this that somebody on the inside, right? Uh, my spouse uh, in scrubs and works at the place. Oh, just go knock on the door at the reading room. Me, who the scans are about, <laughs> is like, well, I'm not sure I want you looking at that information before I have. So that's such an interesting power dynamic uh, that I think just kind of fits into several uh, topics in this conversation. Absolutely. I think I, I've, I've discussed this topic with friends of mine who are doctors and, and one of the, their first reaction was, but what if I, what if they see something before I have? And that was their, that was their sort of instant take on it, which I thought really resonated. It comes back to the harm question as, as well as the autonomy. Harlan, sorry, you were going to come in there. Well, well and I was just going to say on that, but again, it's a question of the person's choice. Do, do I want to know and when do I want to know it? It's not that we're forcing every patient to know this at, at, at a certain time, but it's a question of, of access. But I think the juxtaposition, at least in the United States, between the difficulty, the challenge, the friction that individuals experience in trying to get access to their own health records it can be juxtaposed to the means by which there's this medical industrial complex in which our data is flowing around within companies that we have got no idea about that, that pass through business associate agreements that, that led to large companies that say, we have data on 320 million Americans and they've got deep data that has flowed easily outside of the healthcare environment into 
uh, various different uh, data aggregators and being resold. And again, we have to reset this. I mean, you know, it's sort of like no one ever asked that permission for that to happen. And yet when any individual, we, we did a study where we had a medical student pose as the uh, granddaughter of a patient seeking to help her grandmother understand how she could get access to data. And many institutions, top, these were top institutions around the country, were violating federal laws, were charging excess amounts of money for access to data, were not providing digital uh, access to the information, and were making it so somehow it had to be copied and in and, and, and forms that were going to be very difficult to manage, much like Adam is describing. And, and all of this is in deep need of repair. And I think it starts with the conversation we've had today, which is, you know, I should be able to have some agency over my own data and it should be made to, and the law, by the way, makes it clear, I should be able to get it in ways that are easy and, and seamless and timely. And then I should be able to do with it what I want uh, as a result. And for, the, and for anyone to say to me, what are you gonna do with it? Or how, you won't understand it, is a completely orthogonal issue. I mean, it's not, it's, and I love when Hugo Campos has, has said many times when people are saying, why are you trying to get access to your data? He says, none of your damn business. You know, I don't have to tell you what I'm going to do with it. That's my decision. And, and, you know, I think I was actually, I was very inspired when I first heard you go say that because it's absolutely true. And, uh, and, and that's where we're trying to reset. I think with these conversations, open notes and so many other efforts are trying to make progress, but we really need to reinvigorate our efforts. I think around this. I think one issue that's come up a few, a few times, and, and we sort of, sort of skip past it and I think I think it's, a t it's an interesting one because it, it's come up, coming up a few times ownership um Harlan you made a comment earlier that you think this is a this is a tricky area and possibly a, 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 a not necessarily a red herring but um what what do we think about ownership in this context I must also before we go on Charlotte's dropped off her her internet has crashed she's trying to join us again so we'll hopefully back you back shortly. And, and, and I'll, I'll just say quickly just to clarify what my point about that it just becomes a rabbit hole and, and, and there are legal implications to this which which we can fight about I, I I'm willing to have that that discussion but I think at the very least a lot of what we're saying is what could be done tomorrow like tomorrow everyone should have access to their own data in a time immediate timely way in digital mean by digital means it makes it very easy for them to use transact share, do what they want to do with it. The issue of ownership is more complicated in many societies, it, just because of the way the laws are. It would take us years to restructure some of those laws if we wanted to go after that. But that's why I, I said that not that it's not worth having the discussion, but it's it, at least in many societies, just because of the legal structures there, it's complicated to say who actually owns that data. I think I think the reason I wanted to ra to to raise it is because I think it brings us into the to the final topic, and I'm conscious of time. I want to get to some questions, but that was was the idea that this is this fundamentally is about data. There's an issue on data security here, and my my the the thing I thought about ownership was that whoever is the owner of it is also the person for responsible for maintaining the security. And when we're thinking about the ethics of a topic like this, the argument often put forward is that you know the, the, making this stuff available is going to lead to becoming insecure and that's harm and well, that's which problem. is a hard argument to make when data is flowing all around everywhere and being resold all the time but I, I i and i've i've said this to many people at times which is if you're concerned that if you give me my data that i might lose it or leave it at, at the coffee shop or share it to someone i shouldn't have shared it with then maybe you should also take a take charge of my bank account because i could also be making foolish decisions around my money you know mm. and and maybe you should be taking charge of a lot of other things in my life too, because you know I, I'm capable of actually you know buying something that's a lemon or, or you know, and there there are things going on all the time. I mean, we we need to be able to treat people as adults, fully fledged adults who can make decisions about their life, and we we need to help. We can help by by helping people to know what best practices are, and also be very careful about outlawing scoundrels who are trying to take advantage of people. I mean, we need to to go after that too, but. But I think the idea that we have to protect you from yourself because we can't possibly give you your health data because you might share it to a, you know a, a, someone who might be uh, using it for bad purposes, I just think is it is just out of bounds, honestly. Wondering what others think. I think you've nailed it, Harlem. I mean, yes, there will be some people that take a photo of their medical notes and stick it on Instagram in between a photo of their lunch and you know a photo of a hot guy they've seen in a bar or whatever it is, but. And, but you know it is your notes that that is your right to, your right to, to do it 
I don't think it will, and it shouldn't compromise the security if you can take it, you know, from an API of, of the system that stores it. And obviously that needs to have the highest integrity. And as you've articulated, uh, Harlan, that, that, that data, you know, another question for another day about whether that should be shared with, you know, life science companies and, and insurance companies and, and, and so on and, and so on and so forth. But I don't think it, it will compromise and it doesn't the security of the system that holds it. But as you say, of course, if you're given that data, you can do what you want with it, but that is your, that is your right. It is, it is your data. And, and, but there are some great systems out there that have, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 layers of access. So you, you might want to, Adam might want to have his data electronically and show it to his wife, but he might want to make sure that his, his kids can't see it or whatever else. And that's, you know, just a delegated access kind of, kind of technical thing. But if you're being given that CD, Adam, you can do whatever you want with it and you can, you know, try and flog it with your music CDs if, if that's what you want to do. But Harlem articulated it better than me. It's, it, it, it's mine. I can do what I want with it. Well, and I think, you know, we're not beholden to other decision makers and then it comes down to patients and we've got to figure out how to do it. I mean, I think the, the, the next generation of patient advocacy, I think really happens around health information technology. So as CMS and ONC over here in the States, and I can't speak to within NHS who's doing some of the decision-making, uh, but around information blocking and interoperability, uh, patients shouldn't have to figure that out after the fact. Uh, as new policies are introduced, patients should be there to say, hey, if you're looking at information blocking, here's what's gonna matter most to us patients. So by the time we get to the ground, uh, we don't have to navigate these thorny issues. We've already taken them into account uh, in the beginning of the rulemaking. And, and, and in the UK, um, we, you know, we had these fantastic data sharing principles by uh, Dame Fiona Caldicott, who, who sadly passed away at, at the beginning of this, this year. And you know, when she revised her rules, you know, to not share what was as important as, uh, you know, as, as keeping things confidential, but she's saying, you know, the duty to share where appropriate was as important as, as, as her rules about keeping stuff confidential and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that was, that is now kind of enshrined within the National Health Service. Henry, we have Charlotte back, man. I don't know if she wants to chime in on any I, of this i'm i'm afraid i've got Question. i've got a slightly dodgy connection temporarily well we can let charlotte you, you just joined back I, I mean one one thing i would jump on to say in relation to privacy security around information i i take adam's point i think it's very incredibly important that we don't use this as another grounds of for of paternalism in healthcare that the providers are going to protect you from these other malign forces um, so that's a, which is a separate debate, but you know one of the greatest sources of data breaches is not through the technology, but it's through passwords and patients not having good passwords and pass you know other people logging onto their own health information. For which it's really important that we give patients guidance about uh, how to use patient access to their their electronic health records, how to use portals. Um, not just educating doctors about best use and practice and how to write notes that patients will read, but offering patients that that uh, sense of confidence in using these tools. Sorry, I very briefly lost you all for just a second, but it all seems to be okay again now. Um, anyone else want to come in on, on that point? If, if not, then we can try and move to some questions. So one of the things that comes on up, has come up a lot has been about um, errors and correcting errors. We've, we've covered that quite a bit, but it seems to be something that, that's, um, that is very much at the front of our audience's mind. How do we implement systems that allow for correction of errors? I mean, we talked very briefly about this, the, the concern of putting too much onus on healthcare professionals for this. How do we how do we get this right? Well, I don't I don't have the exact uh, the perfect answer to that, but I can just tell you what we are in Sweden currently are working on that actually is not working, but it's a good idea and it's it's one step forward to actually solve that issue. So um, in Sweden in the County Council of Uppsala they have actually implemented a function in the online record where the patient can comment um, 
errors in their medical record. And so they can actually choose to um, hide these comments so that the physician cannot see, but the patient can see it, or they can um, decide that the physician or the nurse or whatever uh, can access these, these notes or these comments. But the main issue here is, you know, how will the process from that a comment is being sent to the physician is going to look like? Who is the one that should be responsible for handling these comments? And what if the patient is not right? Maybe the patient is saying that this is not correct and the physician is saying, no, this is correct. Who will handle that debate? Any, any thoughts on who, whose responsibility is to handle that, that debate? Or are we back to the, the issue of this has got to be a grown-up conversation and what we're doing is actually giving people autonomy to, to discuss I things has, as equals? It has to be a grown-up conversation. And I think this sort of there's a false dichotomy between what's empowering for the patient can't be empowering for the clinician. So when we empower, when we empower patients, I mean, it's that old slogan that phrase Warner Slack used that the, the patients are the most underutilized resource in healthcare. So if we are listening to what the patient says, as Adam start, kick started the, the whole discussion with, if we're really listening to the patient, we can handle them. Doctors should be able to handle these mistakes, but they've got to be able to read that feedback as well. That's crucial. It's not going to be enough to open the notes. And incidentally, if a patient alerts a doctor to an error in the note and, the, uh, and nobody is reading it, that might be a really interesting source of litigation. Mm. So um, we've got to find a way around this uh, and to address these kinds of issues. Mm. It's, it's something, again, you know, and you know in the UK that um, you, you talk to any parent of twins and this happens all the time because they've got the same date of birth. It's happened to me. Have you got I twins? Got I didn't know sister. that, which it's is a primary look up. Yeah. And so it's happened to you. And also a lot of cultures we have in the UK um, um, in, 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 you know, certain certain religions or even traditions, often people give their twins the same the same middle name, which might be a religiously significant middle name or, or just maybe the mother's maiden name or whatever. So you've got two kids with the same date of birth with the same thing. And, and, and that that is kind of the um, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the warning signal that if, if that mixes up, then you're, you're mixing other people up as well. And, and so Charlotte will talk more to me because I don't have twins and I'm not a twin, but it, it happens all the time in the National Health Service that the wrong twin has the broken arm put onto their record or, or whatever it might be. We've had a very good question about the amount of, about the, the degree to which different types of records should be made available. For example, sort of GP records being available, but, but secondary care scan, scans not being. What are the, what, what are the panel's thoughts on, are there situations where some, some records shouldn't be made available, just different types of, of information, and, the, and particularly the ethical aspects of this? I'll just say quickly, that, I mean, let's take psych, psychiatry aside, uh, just because issues of consent and confidentiality, are, it's a deeper and more complex issue. But besides that, everybody should have access to all of their records. And there's just no, I don't think there's a ethical argument for not making them available. And particularly if people want to have choices about having others take a look. I, I think it's critically important that uh, we, we make them, you know, so that people can, can have their data and, and do with it what they want. What, I, I don't know why, what, how you could argue otherwise. I don't know, someone got into counter argument to that? No, I, I just want to jump in this with a couple of points. I would be remiss not to, to mention Liz Selmy in this call. I don't know if people have already mentioned, but she's done a lovely study of uh, oncology notes and on patients, oncology patients reading their notes, only around 4% viewed the notes as, as more confusing, as confusing, okay? Very confusing. Oncologists anticipated that uh, th over a third of oncologists anticipated that um, patients would find the notes confusing. So that, that disparity is really fascinating. In terms of, so it's, it's hard not to, to view patients as being negatively stereotyped there as well. Um, when it comes to serious mental illness, we have actually done an analysis of survey data and looked at patients with diagnosed with schizophrenic disorders, major depressive disorders, um, bipolar disorders. They report even greater benefits from reading their notes and, uh, than other patients, but also um, around 20% compared to 14% of other patients with no mental health diagnosis reported doing a better job taking their medications. So 
having said that there will be test cases, you know, the anorexic patient who might not might not benefit that patient to see their weight, but that should be something that's discussed. You know, is it, are they going to be more stigmatized from information blocking, or are they? Uh, is it going to be better and have a discussion about will not show your weight because that might lead to certain harms? But those cases must be dealt with on a on a case by case basis. I'm going to have to draw a end to the discussion here we're out of time um we could go on for at least another half hour i think we could probably go on for another 24 hours if we let everyone um this has been such a good discussion and i want to say a huge thank you to everyone there's many questions in the in the comments um there's a lot of love for liz salmi in the comments as well um liz um great great to, to, to see you in there um thank you everyone um this has been an incredible discussion um regretfully have to call it a day there but please do continue the the, the, the conversation on social media the hashtag is bmj uh, record bmj records access um we have three more webinars to go there have been many co discuss comments in the discussion about health inequalities particularly which is the subject of the third webinar in the series the second webinar which will be um, hosted by my colleague Emma this time next week will be on something we've touched on a bit here, the cultural and professional barriers to all of this. So please do join us for that. Um, the link to sign up is on the BMJ Twitter account. Um, and if you can find it on there, I think that will have to do for this week. This has been great. Thank you again to all Thank our you. panelists. Thank you guys. This Thank has you. been a fantastic great. discussion, a great way to set off the series and um, see you all at the next one. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.